get started, we are expecting a few more people to join us today. Uh, this is the Healthy Climate Change meeting for June 8th, 2023. And we have a special guest, Mindy Dom, who will be joining us today. Um, after we're hoping for another person with uh, Myra Shulman to join us, we'll see how that all goes. So, Mindy, welcome. Thank you Thank for you. coming today. Sure. Um, let's quickly go around the room so you know everybody <laughs> in the audience. So, I'm Jack Sikowski. Kathy Nelson. It's Susie Milzer. My name is Thomas Phil. Susan Melton. Stephen Devine. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I should let you know that I've let uh, Rep. Kerry know that I'll be here tonight because he's obviously the representative for Hadley and um, he sends his best and he's, su he's a supporter of many of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight. So oh, it's good to, to, to connect you to that. So I think you asked me to come and speak about the Climate Science Education Trust Fund. Yes. And so um, I think I'll talk a little bit about why I filed this and what's happening to it. Is that be all right? And I don't know, um, is anybody here from either Amherst or Granby? Just curious. Okay. Um, how many people work in school settings? Hi. Hi. Thanks. Hi. Come on in, Mara. I just Can you where you want to yeah. yeah. Mara, have you met Mindy before? I haven't met you. I've spoken to one of your staff. Oh, great. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So um, this bill came about for a couple of different reasons. One, um, I'm very aware that youth um, are feeling sometimes very hopeless about the climate crisis and anxious and worried and concerned. I'm also very aware that simultaneously we have like a mental health crisis going on in the country and particularly with youth. And at the same time, I represent Hitchcock Center for Education and the Environment, who during COVID was very involved with doing remote education and professional development for teachers across Massachusetts and the country, and was talking with them about the capacity for teachers to be teaching climate science and what was happening in the classroom, believing that not only is knowledge power, but that if we provide this education to students, we are going to give them the tools to be able to help us correct the situation, remedy the problem, and respond to it. Um, and through my conversation with local teachers, Hitchcock Center, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, what became clear to me was that my best way of contributing to this, um, this challenge was rather than dictating specific standards for curriculum framework, although the bill does that to some extent, would be really to develop a way, like a pool of funds, that could help support the education of teachers to go and teach students. The teachers wanted to be doing this. They wanted to be bringing it to the classroom, but they had not learned this. When they were going to school and getting their degrees, there weren't classes on how to teach or communicate about climate science. Um, and what they really needed was professional development sample curricula, resources, um, materials K through 12. I ended up finding out that nine through 12, Desi felt was being taken care of, but it was really middle school that they wanted to focus on. And I know people who in the K through six space were saying they need to do it. Um, you know, I'm driving over today and I'm listening to the Washington Post daily blog, um, podcast about the fires and about um, unhealthy. Okay, so we're living in the age where are not shielded from the results of what's happening. Um, and so through conversation with DESE, which is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, um, they identified the need for me that resource development and professional development was really acute for teachers. In speaking with teachers, I found that that was confirmed, at least the teachers in my district. And in talking with Hitchcock Center, they also confirmed that. And they, they also added a little twist to the legislation, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so we went about developing what's called a trust fund. And trust funds exist in the Massachusetts legislature. They're places, they're like a line where ultimately you can fund, you can put money into it. They don't start out with money unless we appropriate money in the budget process, but it becomes a space in the budget for money to go to for a particular objective. 
And the other great thing about trust funds is you can put when you're creating them that they don't expire at the end of a fiscal year. So if there's money still left in the trust fund, it can carry on to the following year to accomplish the same goals. Um, when I first got elected, which was in 2018, there was a bill that was kicking around the legislature to create a gen to um, to uh, mandate genocide education in high schools in Massachusetts. And the first couple of years, it didn't go anywhere. And then the people who were filing that bill instead went a different direction. They created a genocide education trust fund to be able to train teachers or to be able to pay outside people to come in to provide this education. And through a combination of things, that legislation was passed. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a page out of something that was recently successful, and I'm going to go the route of trying to help train the trainers, in a sense. I come from an adult training background, um, and, you know, curriculum costs money, great training costs money, um, and teachers wanted it, and they needed it to be able to teach students. So we went that direction. So we so started to develop it. Can you just dig into that other um, vein? The, the genocide? Genocide education. Was that about the Holocaust? It was not just about the Holocaust. It was also about Armenians. And okay. there's, so it's, it's much broader than the gotcha. Holocaust. Did it include it, Native Americans? Yes, it did, actually. It does. It's, it, it passed, so it's, it's there. But it also includes the Holocaust. Okay. So it would include not only training for teachers on the Holocaust, but bringing in expert speakers or bringing in other resources like films, etc. Yeah. Whatever you need, to be able to provide the education to students, that's what was required. And, you know, for me, I'll be honest with you, I support the genocide education um, bill, but I did hear from teachers my first term that it was just like another unfunded mandate to put it on as a curriculum goal without providing them with resources mm -hmm. and professional development. And that's the last thing I want to do to teachers overall, but especially coming out of COVID, I don't want to necessarily put another unfunded mandate on them particularly something they want to be doing, but they just need the resources and tools. So I'm going to take a break if there are any questions so far. You know, one thing I'll say is Massachusetts is always first or second in the nation, mm -hmm. depending on how you measure education. But um, we have the reputation of being one of the leading states for this. I know now the current um, math standard, the math science standards for earth science, Letter C, 3C, it's human impacts on Earth systems. Right. Human activities have altered the biosphere, sometimes damaging it, although changes to environments can have different impacts for different living things. Activities and technology can be engineered to reduce people's impact on Earth. Right. That is, you know, I teach eighth graders science, and that's in in the list of standards that exactly. I'm supposed so, to address. So this is part of the reason why when I met with DESE, they were saying, you don't need to make new standards. We have the standards. We need to get the tools to teachers to be able to implement the standards. Um, but the thing I get to do when I create this trust fund or when I legislate, you know, when I create the legislation, because I don't actually create the trust fund, right? I create the bill that has the ideas. Then it has to go through a committee, have a public hearing go through the committee. The committee chairperson gets to kind of redraft it if they think they want to or not. The committee has to vote on whether to advance it in the legislative journey. If they say yes to advancing it, it goes probably in this case to the House Committee on Ways and Means. And then I still have to advocate and other people have to advocate to try to get that bill out of Ways and Means so that legislators can vote on it. And if reps vote on it and it passes, and the Senate votes on it, and it passes, and it's identical. Then it goes to the governor for signature. The, the journey is, um, do you know the game shoots and ladders? Yeah, <laughs> long and arduous. It sounds it's, like. it's a, you know, people have said to me, well, why don't things get done faster? It's like because it's a very deliberate process on purpose. But it can stall out. It can. A couple so days. advocates and residents, and you don't have to be like a formal advocate. You can just be a supporter or an opponent. Um, have to be constantly monitoring and tracking it. Legislators do too, but really it's a people's house, meaning that the pressure comes from outside the house. Um, I'm the spokesperson for the pressure, but I'm, my pressure alone isn't going to do anything. Yeah. So have you gotten pushback? No, um, not so yet. And I actually think this bill has a good chance because it does, first of all, it's not asking for money yet. 
It's just creating a fund. And it's also trying to support the implementation of standards. But the pushback would be that it just doesn't rise to the top of a priority list. Because in order for it to move, there has to be view that there is outside interest in it um, and pressure, and then it, that it's a priority. And as you may know, the legislature, the past two sessions, the House, specifically I can talk about because I'm a rep, um, has taken on big climate bills, right? So not last session, but the session before we passed the first one called the Roadmap Bill. Last session we passed um, something that actually tried to implement the roadmap bill, which is was a huge piece that a lot of people don't realize has a lot of fantastic legislation in it. The person who chairs that committee, his name is Jeff Roy, he saw that how many bills were out there that were introduced on all different aspects of the climate and tried to weave together a bill that included a lot of the pieces from a lot of different members across the district. There was a, a bill that Rep. Lay from Deerfield and I filed around solar that was included in there. There's a grid modernization piece that's in there. EV bikes are in there. There's just a lot of great stuff. We passed that and we also passed a wind bill. So that was last year, last session. We've come up to this session and there's full intention to do another big climate bill. It's possible that this bill could be tacked on to that bill but the big climate bill comes out of a committee called, and forgive me if I'm getting too much in the weeds, just do this and I'll shut up. Um, the, the big climate bill comes out of the Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy Committee, right, yeah, otherwise right. known as TUA. This bill is going to come out of education. So I need to get this bill advanced out of education so I can bring it to Jeff Roy and say, do you think that this has a place on your bill? Because I don't think we're gonna do a big K through 12 bill this year. We may do a big trial care bill, but I'm not sure about K through 12, but I think we are doing a big climate bill. Yeah. And so just so other people in this room are clear on this, every day when I'm teaching lessons, I start with the state standard. I don't always read it to the kids, right, but, but I start with that as the target in mind. I have 24 standards that I need to teach to my eighth graders over 180 days. That's, that's and that's the goal. And then they're tested ultimately on the MCAS. So it's it's pretty high stakes. We're one of eight states that still have that as a graduation requirement where the kids have to pass the MCAS or else they don't get their diploma. That's a whole other issue. That is a whole other issue, but I don't think that was with other legislation. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, oh go ahead. I have a question. Um, it, I'm wondering if you have had conversations with um, Climate Chief Hopper, um, in part because you know she's really concerned with workforce development and is working across the departments to try to sort of build the pipeline. And what I hear you're saying is that basically you're helping to build the bottom part of the ladder. Well, it's interesting that you say that because that's the piece that, I, if you're talking about this part that I'm thinking about, that's the part that um, Hitchcock wanted to add in, which was that part of what this trust fund would fund is education around jobs in the field, basically. Well, um, it, it's preparing for the jobs right. and then what jobs are out there. Right, it's, exactly. It's both but this, that is actually in the bill, that it would be um, that part of what the trust fund is able to fund is professional development around the jobs in the future, basically. Um, I haven't talked with... Uh, Climate Chief Hoffer about this particularly, but you know she's also very involved with youth climate activists, yeah. and they have another bill that they have worked very hard on, um, which actually sets very specific climate science standards. Mm -hmm. um, and I've talked with them. There, you may know that many of the students who are involved in this are from the Valley, from mm -hmm. Hadley, well, Amherst, Holly, yes, and some and, of the others, right, yeah. and from East Hampton. And I actually have a meeting with, I've met with Ali a couple of times, but we have a specific meeting coming up soon to talk about the two bills. I don't see my bill as in competition with their bill at all. My bill allows whatever the standards are yeah. that are determined. To be tough. It supports yeah. teachers to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that uh, the youth activists are very connected to what curriculum objectives they've developed in their bill. Um, and so I think they just want to make sure that the trust fund would not conflict with that. I don't see it as conflicting. Um, I really just see my bill as a way to say, we don't expect teachers who went to school 10, 20, 30 years ago to know this. And so we have to, everybody has to learn. You know what I'm saying? Students have to learn it, but teachers have to learn it. 
Um, so I do think that Chief Hoffer may be aware of this effort, but she may be aware of it through the youth activists and their curriculum bill. I, I don't know. I you know I can check. Um, but the I guess I'm just thinking about sort of how to popularize this and mm -hmm. make it not be like you know the last thing on the bottom of the right. bill, but something that actually helps with the larger objectives of the administration. I love that, and I'm open to all your ideas because <laughs> um, it won't happen unless it does that. Right. I mean, it could happen because, like I said, Chairman Roy, he's a, I think he's an exceptionally good chairperson. He's really thoughtful. He really learns everything. And the thing I love about him is that he looks at what the body has introduced. Like he looks at what 160 people have filed. And he says, so what have they filed makes sense in this bill? And so it's not his bill. It's mm -hmm. our bill. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very unique legislator, you know, who's creating this big picture of bills from all these little bills um, and be having them all hold together. Um, so... It could happen that he would just, you know, yeah, you know, we'll put this in there too. But I think it's not going to happen unless people on the outside say, we want this, we need this. Mm -hmm. um, so what I was saying initially about students feeling potentially hopeless and helpless, I have to say, I also see this as a mental health bill. You know, it's not. Yeah, and I, you're right. But I see it. It gives them, like, some, it bites into it. Yes, and hope is, hope is based on action. And this gives students and teachers a way to have action. Because teachers being empowering teachers to be able to teach about it helps students imagine, identify, and be inspired to act. And for students who aren't already acting on climate, um, it potentially gives them the opportunity to do that in a more thoughtful way. So, um, so if yes, you can just please go um, ahead. hold on for a second um, and just see if there's any other questions. Sure. From anyone, kids, grandkids. You know what you're thinking about this idea. I have more questions. <laughs> um, one of the questions I have is, you know, you've just interestingly framed it as a mental health bill based on the sort of action that is being enabled. But I'm wondering if your bill could explicitly include that. It does. Well, it doesn't explicitly include the mental health piece, but it does explicitly talk about actions that can be taken. And it talks about social activism around environmental. Well, stuff. the reason I say it is because I've been working with teachers who are faced with basically desperate students and who don't know how do I support that and who are, you know, in need of learning what is a trauma-informed approach to right. teaching and so on and so forth. So there can could I, be can, something. Can I read you some aspects sure. of the bill? Yeah. Would that be all right? Um, so in the beginning, the sort of the introduction, the professional resource development funded by the Climate Science Education Trust Fund can seek to increase students' understanding of one's influence on climate and climate's influence on the individual society and society and students' knowledge and capacity to do the following. Understand Earth's climate system, the natural and human caused factors that affect the climate and contribute to climate change through observations, data collection, analysis, and the ability to evaluate and construct scientific explanations about climate, leading to decisions that improve quality of life and environmental health. Two, assess scientifically credible information about climate. Three, Communicate about climate and climate change in a meaningful way. Four, make informed and responsible decisions with regard to actions that may affect climate. Five, understand the strategies used by the Commonwealth to address climate impacts concerning policy, community action, and individual behavior. Uh, six, demonstrate awareness of the fundamental relationship between climate and society. Seven, take action to reduce the crisis in climate. And eight, build the skills that will inspire and prepare them for potential careers related to uh, climate change. So the activism piece is in there. It's not the only place. If you'll give me one moment, I'll also. So another aspect, another piece, it talks about um, what the money can be used for. The development, purchase, distribution, and implementation of curricular materials detailing the underlying causes international reaction, history and progression of scientific climate research, evidence-based policy solutions, and the role of climate and environmental activism in making policy change. So I don't know if this specifically answers what you're saying, but for me, 
it's by including the role of climate and environmental activism in making policy change. That means it's also a history of environmental activism in this country and what people did to affect change and how it affected change mm-hmm. and how we still have to continue to work. I think that's great. And I, I don't have any problems with that. My concern is more around the what kind of professional development for teachers does it pay for? Does oh. it include, for example, what it means to be a trauma-informed teacher? I don't think it is included in this, but that's okay. That Can I make a suggestion to you? Mm-hmm. Let me, I'm just going to write it down before I forget it. Um, legislation is a conversation, right? So the bill starts the conversation. It's the conversation starter. Yeah. It's not the conversation closer. Yeah. The conversation closer actually happens when the governor signs whatever is in front of the governor. But meanwhile, there's a didactic that happens. There's a communication that happens. And when the public hearing happens, that's the opportunity for people, including myself or the public, to say, we like this bill, but we think it can be made better if you did this to it, if you did that to it, but if you did this to it. And I'm going to encourage you that when it gets a hearing to submit comments that say, we think being a trauma-informed educator would be an important piece for this to be also. Can I just ask, what does that mean, trauma-informed educator? So a lot of students now um, either have experienced climate impacts, you know, the okay. kind of stuff that is happening, disasters, or they're um, traumatized by the information that they're learning about of what's going to happen with climate change. Um, and a lot of teachers don't know how to handle that, you know, Eco anxiety, eco grief, right, climate right. grief, so all of those be, things. That so it's, like it's, it should be included. Yeah, I mean, the, the teachers I've been training essentially, it's all about sort of what do you need to know, how to confront that situation, how do you take care of yourself as a teacher, having to basically convey the bad news, if you will, and how do you take care of the students who are in your charge um, who might be experiencing that. Yeah. And so you don't learn that in science school. So, so, I just want to make sure it's not included, in it, but I don't think it is. But it's also maybe something that I'm going to include in my comments. So, over the last few weeks, I've been part of a training on youth mental health first aid. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. the kind of stuff that's So, um, it was two weeks ago, I went with a half dozen other teachers from my school, and we all get trained on working around issues related to fentanyl and some other, mm-hmm. you know, some other substances but also you know post covid um that has really turned the, the world upside down oh for God, lots of kids yeah the shootings i teach in a virtual public school so it's really interesting um we're far less likely to get shot occasionally we get together but you know it's not a typical school where somebody can get in and maybe shoot um, i've worked in brick and mortars too where that could happen you have to go through training for that um but the youth mental health through the collaborative in northampton was amazing yeah absolutely been. amazing program and you know i'm not going to dwell on it but um i i can send them to you i have some samples from what my students did here steve you know this is you know my kids are creating websites you know on cleaning the ocean and you can actually see their work i had another one who did it on Beads. Both my brothers farm full time. I farm part time and renting bees to keep the squash growing and everything else. This is something we do, but the declining bee population is terribly it's harmful. Well, yeah, throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the country. And what some of the students have done with their work, it's as professional as some college students that I've worked with in the past, too. It's just incredible. Um, well, I'm going to include this actually in my comments. So that committee which should have weight since it's my bill um because i also in the bill the one of the ways it connects to the bill besides what you're saying is that we set out how desi can decide you know that how the money gets distributed like we they'll be charged with doing a grant program and this is what here's some ideas for what would be prioritized and we specifically say schools that are in environmental justice communities or serve students from environmental justice communities will be prioritized. So once we do that, this becomes probably a more critical piece because we're also saying, you know what I'm saying, there's kind of like, it's an oversight on my part that I didn't include it initially. I mean, not that, it wasn't an oversight to include that environmental justice communities get prioritized, but it was an oversight to think 
that this might not be necessary. And keep in mind that there are schools out there now, like us. I see 110 eighth graders every day. Some are from mm. environmental justice communities. Some are not. But right. it's a mix of kids from well, all across this, the Commonwealth. Well, and this, this, the bill doesn't specify what percentage of the student population it has to be from an environmental justice community. Just that it recognizes that schools may not be located in the environmental justice community, but serve environmental justice. And I'll tell you, the eighth graders are really tuned in. This was just such a stunning week where we started teaching, and they were all commenting about the sky well, yeah, and wondering why and what was going on. You know, I think that um, this is an educational moment for people of all ages, <laughs> is the Canadian fires, because it also speaks to the fact of what happens when you burn trees and and why does that happen and why do trees and it kind of rolls back to so why are trees as far as so important because they sequester carbon and so when they get burned there's it's like breathing and well and they also make oxygen so we can all live <laughs> yeah but in this case yeah when i'm no no but what i'm what no I'm i know what you're saying is that when people talk about the smoke being very toxic and unhealthy i think we have to talk about, well, that's because it's been sitting in a tree for a long time and helping to protect our planet. Well, and the kids had an opportunity today to learn about the air quality index, uh -huh. and it was 476 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania this morning. Stunning. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. Well, right now, if I may use my app just to tell you, so I have a daughter that lives in California, so she gave me the name of this app, like, you know, two years ago, or whatever, about the fires. It's called IQ Air Visual. And so I have several towns on this. So Amherst is 95, which is moderate. But my daughter, Jordan, lives in Baltimore, and she's at 180, unhealthy. Yeah. So there you go. It would be interesting to put Springfield on there. I've heard I do have Springfield on there. There is like a <laughs> oh, conduit. That Springfield, Springfield is 93. Gets, what is it, 93? Yeah. Oh, that's good. It's dumped on all the time. And I know people that have asthma. It looks so pretty here. But we're still we still get a lot of stuff. Valley tend Valley. to trap the air. From yeah, the West. Valley and ninety one and yeah. the way the air flows up from New York yeah. City. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, any other questions about the where we talked about so far about the trust? Fund? I have a question. Sure. You you're mentioning about educating about the climate science. Mm -hmm. Is it going to make any references to some of the negative things with the push? for this green power. Oh, and I'm referring to like the push for nuclear power, um, which I personally feel has some detrimental problems. Um, the windmills in the ocean outside of New Jersey and New York where the whales are beaching themselves. So there's everything's not rosy with the push for green power is what I'm referring to. Well, I have to say, you and I agree on one thing. I'm also not a supporter of nuclear power. <laughs> um, uh, I feel like we haven't figured out the waste of nu nuclear power, and um, civilian nuclear power was really developed initially as a militant, you know, for plutonium, for the bombs, and we haven't quite figured out that transition. So we're in agreement on this. Um, but this bill will not talk about that. And we'll talk about, I mean, we don't mandate, talk about the, the um, debates around citing windmills or citing solar energy, but it does talk about what are the, some of the remedies and the complexities of that. And so that would be discussed within there. You know, there's also discussions around solar siting. Where should solar panels be? Should they be in like the built environment or should they be on the empty fields in Granby? I represent the town of Amherst and half of Granby. And Granby's got lots of vacant land that it probably could be fine if people wanted to develop put solar panels. Amherst would be, no, we don't want it on the open fields. We want the open fields to be open and we want it on the roofs. And so that whole discussion of where to site solar is a discussion that could actually come out, that a teacher could be taught on how to discuss it as part of this bill, because it's all about transition. If we're going to transition to an energy source, we have to understand what we're getting into. So though it doesn't get spelled out either way, um, and I don't spell out anti-nuclear power, although I share that opinion. Um, it does talk about you know, transition or, and remedies and what are the complexities of that. So, uh, you know, I think, I know that teachers 
don't need to be spoon fed. You need to do this, this, and this when you're teaching about, for example, transition to energy. But they do need to have the information so they can weigh out the pros and cons. When my kids were in eighth grade, they had teachers that were so fantastic. My kids would come home and they would debate with themselves. You know, the pros on this is this, the cons on this is this, and they learn those skills from their classes. So I think that it's addressed, but not maybe as specifically as you're asking for it. Because if everything would, okay, um, just quick, electric cars, way more you know, batteries that are, can be hazardous because of the, there's a thing called tire pollution that you're wearing on tires quicker because the cars are heavier. So there's, there's some negatives to um, the alternatives. So it'd be great at. to have students be learning so that they could figure out how to mitigate those negatives. Right. That's the point of the trust fund. Is that if we're going to move towards, if we're identifying certain um, efforts that are creating a climate crisis, then we need students who are engaged, hopeful, optimistic that they can make a difference in mitigating those differences, including these. Um, but it sounds like this is a good exercise in critical thinking, like not just buying into something really nilly, but really learning. Well, I think teachers, they, I think that's what makes our teachers great, is that they're not just spoon-feeding students one way of thinking. They are teaching them critical thinking about everything, um, I'm assuming. Yes. i my best. <laughs> so, so you weigh the pros and the cons. and then I mean, I don't think my kids thing. ever knew what their teachers' actual opinions were on anything except they knew that their teachers wanted them to understand the pros and the cons. And how to make a good decision. Right. And I think part of what this, as, as I pointed out, part of what the trust fund um, is supposed to pay for in terms of professional development and resource development and curriculum development is how to, how to, how to weigh these issues and, and how to feel empowered to do something about it. You know, I recently... Um, your question makes me think about this. I recently went to um, UMass had a big symposium on wind energy. I don't know if you know, UMass is like got this thing called the wind center. Right. It's like the first wind center in the whole country. And before they were talking in there in the symposium, all the students who had done posters on different aspects of environmental issues were standing next to their posters and there to talk to you about them, whatever you wanted to say about them. I was, I left so hopeful and optimistic, not because everybody was saying the same thing or that they were all um, saying a particular thing about climate or, or focusing on one aspect or another, only EVs and not something else or just wind and not something that they weren't doing that, but because they were so engaged in trying to understand how they could make a difference in it. And I think, that's what the trust fund is really designed to do at the younger ages. Because I think when I talk to younger students, and some of them, um, you called it something, echo anxiety. Is that what you said? Um, eco anxiety. Eco anxiety. That, um, I mean, I've heard that from students, and that's a concern for me. That's a concern. I have to address a concern. Um that you're not discussing the pros and the cons, which is what Tom was saying. You're just presenting one viewpoint. No, and she was saying the opposite. Okay, because mitigating is not the same word as discussing pros and cons. I'm saying like You're that saying the if, pros are all pro, 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 but there are cons to all of these ideas. These, This is all in transition. Well, what I'm hearing is not cons to these ideas, but challenges to these ideas. But there are cons. And, and, potential, and potential adverse effects. So I come from a, a position where if there is an adverse impact, we look to see what are the measures that would mitigate that impact, that adverse impact, um, or eliminate it. And so this would hopefully provide teachers with resources to be able to teach that piece of it. But it's really designed to make sure that students are getting the information so that students ultimately can make those decisions and engage in these kind of conversations without feeling hopeless. So they'll be presented all sides of these topics. I'm not, not dictating, I'm not dictating who, what a particular teacher or school 
will be able to get. What the bill does is it says this fund will help support the acquisition of professional development and resource development and curriculum development that helps teachers do the following. That's what the bill does. It doesn't say teachers will do the following. It doesn't say every school will have to do what this bill is saying. It's saying that if a school decides that it, that its teachers need support to be able to hit some of these curriculum benchmarks, this fund will help support that. So that a school district doesn't have to figure out, we have to put out another $5,000 for professional development, or we have to put out another $10,000 to develop a curriculum. They can actually tap it to this fund and bring it right to the school. So Susan, I, I, I want to say, you know, the, the B argument was a great one mm -hmm. because students will say, that's it, just eliminate pesticides. Like, wait a minute. I understand. You I know, there's the no argument. way we can actually wipe out pesticides and keep going and you'll get all the food that you need. There are ways, though, that if you spray later at night, there are ways if you watch the bee cycles and things like that, that you can have what the farmers need. You can have what protects the bees a little bit. So I'm saying to the students, you are challenged to try to figure out this balance because it is not one way or the other. It's probably something in the middle. You know, but Jack, one of the theories about the declining bee population is cell phones. You know, so the cell phone may be affecting the bee population. But it's not the law of why bees are declining. It's a theory. It is a theory. It's one of the theories, but there's also many other theories. You know, if you spray during the day and you wipe out a lot of bees, that's not a great thing either. Well, not all pesticides are hurting bees. It's the neonics, right? Right. Some are far more lethal to bees than others. But there's, again, there's many, many possibilities. This is a very complex world we live in with a lot more than one or two variables. Yeah, it's really just an enabling bill. Essentially, providing resources so the teachers can yeah, teach be, their yeah. students to be critical thinkers. Specifically about climate issues. Right. Please, what is a youth climate activist exactly? Oh my gosh. I understand each word. I have to, but, I have to tell you, have to get you, have to meet these, you have to meet these kids. And I... They blow me away. I'm being serious. Bringing Ollie to talk might be an interesting. That's a okay. A youth climate. I'll do each word, but, and I'm not. Believe me, I'm, I, I'm. Please forgive me if this sounds disrespectful because I'm going to break it down in my own head too. So they're youth. So I'm going to say they're probably the ones that I've met are in middle school or high school, and they're climate activists, which means they are dedicating themselves when they're not in school, and maybe when they are in school, but definitely when they're not in school, to learning about climate change, to learning about how they can become active and helpful in their community, to reduce the bad effects of what's going on with climate change, and to educate their peers. And they do this in a variety of ways. So they might do something with bees because that or plastic bags um you know like there's a fifth grader in Ch in crocker farm who organized her class to get her food service uh in the school not to use plastic bags anymore and you know how they did it this is what i mean by they're in incredible the food service people said, well, we'd love to use paper bags, but we can't because it takes too much time to open the paper bags. The plastic bags take us less time, so it's more efficient for us to use plastic. So these 10 fifth graders give up 10 minutes of their recess time every week, and they open up paper bags for the food service people to use. And it was kind of like, wow, dedication, yeah. commitment to trying to help their community. But, so they, but they also lobby. They will meet with legislators to say, what am I doing about, you know, trying to make their world a better place? What am I doing about the Canadian fires? I'm expecting them to say, what are you going to do about the health effects of the Canadian fires? You know, how are we helping people who have asthma who are facing this? Um, so they, they're they activists. They're organized. They learn. They educate themselves. They're educating each other. Um, and then they're educating their parents, their families, their communities, and their legislators. So that's what I mean by youth climate activists. They have an organization, um, the one that created the curriculum piece. I think it's like Youth Climate Action. That's what they call themselves. 
and there there's some of the youth that's looking at the potential future of the world and they were scared and so they're getting involved very good thank you sure i really i encourage you if you can to meet them and just have them talk to you about their journey they'll be very open with you and I, they blow me away with actually how articulate they are. I kind of sit there sometimes like, how old did you say? Are, are they objective? And no, they're not. They're very subjective. Mm -hmm. They're very much like, this is my world and this is why I'm involved. It's, and it's going to be my world for a while. Right. And they're very, I'm, I'm, I really mean that. I mean, in a, in not a discrediting way, mm -hmm. they're very, sub, they're like, I'm involved in this because I'm the one that's going to be facing this. Well, look at what happened this spring when we did the Hadley Cleanup Day. For the first time ever, we had the National Honor Society from Hopkins who came in and they helped us pick up trash all around the town. Wow. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Whether yeah. it was the bike trail or by UMass. Or that was the places. first time that they had done it. That was the first time the kids had done it. That This was our third time doing it. And the YCAN came to our climate day. We had a Hadley Climate yeah. Day a couple of years ago, and one year ago. Is it just one year? I thought yeah, it was one year ago. No, it this came like to that, that ever. That, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, Viking Camp. It came to this site and did it, so that was pretty yeah. good. I I have to say, I've been really. Um, I haven't been lobbied that effectively by a lot of adults when they come to talk to me, because they're able to tell me what they what the problem is as they see it and why they're so concerned and what they want me to do about it. And that's the best lobbying I can tell you to ever do. That, that if you do those three things, anybody is doing good lobbying, but they're able to do it in a way that, like I said, is very subjective and actually very meaningful. Well, as a teacher, you know, any resources help. That's my, that's my hope. Yeah. You know, the one part that we didn't put in this that I just want to put out there is we didn't put um, a parent program. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that because my background is in health education, which also sometimes was sex education. And I'm a big believer in, you know, accurate inf health information being given to students, but I'm also a big believer in parallel classes for parents so that parents know what their kids are learning. And so they can discuss it together. So there's like a lot of people are, don't want that kind of information being given to kids because they get concerned about values being um, transferred to the kids. And so if parents are learning what kids are learning, then they have an opportunity to say, so these are my values about what you're learning. You know, I don't want you doing this, or I feel this is unhealthy, or whatever. Um, but I, we didn't put that in with this, you know, to sort of because... But it would have been interesting because just like teachers maybe haven't learned about climate science, maybe parents haven't learned about climate science, and it'd be good for kids and parents to talk to each yeah. other about it. But that's not it. That was just a distraction. And just a little side note, the seventh graders at Hopkins this week are painting some Keep Hadley Clean signs. And wherever we have the biggest messes, we hang them up. Oh, we yeah. did one round a couple of years ago. The signs are sort of simplistic, a little hokey looking, but um, they really that. make a difference because truly there are some places where so many people will just dump their trash. Is this based on where you picked up a lot of trash? They, oh, I love that. So they did. It's not a scientific basis. <laughs> it's just we want to hit both sides of Mount Warner this year, and there's some other parts of town that will hang those signs including next to UMass. That's awesome. Can I say one other, uh, can I talk about one other building yeah. that I have that may be of interest? Um, you may know about the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness mm -hmm. Program. Mm -hmm. Does Hadley have MVP money? Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who don't know, this is a, a state program that's very popular. Hi. Hi. Um, that provides municipalities with money to do climate resilience projects. And Everybody loves it. I mean, I think almost every town that I've ever um, kind of, you know, kind of interacted with, when they get it, they just love it. It lets them do projects that sometimes have been longstanding and sometimes haven't, but, but all are related to climate resilience, getting, making sure that we're strong enough to resist a bad impact of the severe climate change. 
And so one of the bills that I also filed this session is like an MVP-ish program, but specifically for farms and fisheries. So the MVP program is for municipalities, the town of Hadley, the town of Amherst, the town of Pelham, the town of Granby. My bill is based on this, but it's also specific for farms and fisheries with the recognition that for especially farmers, I know them better than fisheries, but are on the front lines of climate change, like maybe or extreme weather for sure. And so are fisher, so are fisher people. Um, whether it's a concern about windmills or it's a concern about warmer temperatures in the ocean, um, as a result of climate change, there are impacts. And so this particular program would provide funding for farms or fisheries who would apply for it to you know, to incorporate and construct and implement their own resilience projects. And I'm very excited about that. I don't think it's going to go anywhere this session because it's, you know, the first session that's been filed. But I'm hoping that as the rest of the Commonwealth begins to understand that farms and fisheries are at risk, that we'll start to think about maybe helping them out too. Well, just look at the GoFundMe pages that are up for farms oh, this year. Sobieski yeah, what, yeah. with the frost. Yeah. What about and for um, J&J &J with well, the was fire? It Black yeah. Birch? Well, J&J, yeah. &J, well, that's well, true. That was a lightning yeah. Black storm. Black Birch, what I hear is all fruit producers. Yeah. It, peaches, apples. They're all suffering, yeah. Grapes, blueberries, strawberries. Ardale Farm in Greenfields. Yep. So many of the farmers have lost their fruit crops for this year. Yep. So Rep Lay has a bill that deals with like a climate emergency grant program, which is a little bit different. That's like you get this bad frost and you lose your crop and your crop insurance, but it only does X, Y, or Z. What else is going to help the farmers? My bill would come in like almost after that. So when that after that happens, so how am I going to prevent that from happening in the future? Or what did I learn from that situation as a farmer that I needed to have that I didn't have? And then be a grant program that would allow them to get the funding to yeah. do that. Did, Steve, did you end up taking in any cows from J and J? Yes, yes. How many do you have? How many do we have? Yes, I've met, I've, met, I've gone to the farm a couple of times, and I hear his girls are doing very well yep. in neighboring farms. Yep. We both bought one. Wow, it's great. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people really stepped up. Um, everybody. It was amazing. Everybody stepped up. It wasn't up. even a week ago, was it? Right, a week ago tomorrow. Yeah. So there was a local dairy farm. It was actually Amherst Last Surviving Dairy Farm. Yeah, oh, that was struck by it's an Amherst. Amherst, and it was struck by lightning, and they lost three barns, mm -hmm. something like that. A yeah. lot of hay. The house, um, the house was affected. Right? The house was affected, but they yeah. didn't lose it. Buildings, all the buildings. It, but the house was really damaged, yeah. and um, somebody started to go fund me with the goal of 50,000 and as of today they had 127,000. It's going to be very helpful to them because even though they may be able to get state grants and funds, those won't come to later. So the short-term mm -hmm. piece. Yeah, that was a real loss for them for sure. Well, some of their equipment was damaged. A too. lot of that. Yeah. No loss of life. Goodness. Yeah. Oh. So I'm happy. I'm proud of that bill because I, I think that bill addresses um, our community in a way that is it's not always addressed. So how would farmers even apply for that or would they have to oh, go no. through others? Oh no, it would be farmers could directly apply if ultimately through to NDAR for it. So, you know, right now we have something called the Food Security Infrastructure Grant Program that Governor Baker set up during COVID that is orchestrated and overseen by the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources where farmers and other food security partners can apply directly, like they open up certain rounds. Um, and this would be a similar kind of thing. The MDAR would be charged with figuring out the grant process and then just distributing the money. So I would recommend you somewhere in this process have people available to help whoever Absolutely. is applying. I totally get agree. The forms. Technical assistance is a must, especially for farms and fisheries. They really don't have the time to write grants. Exactly. Absolutely. And they're not grant writers, right. they're farmers and fisheries. Right. Yes. This actually, the grant does include a technical right. assistant. Thank you. But one more question. I saw one of the headlines in the Boston Globe a couple weeks ago that only 10 bills 
that have been filed this year mm -hmm. have actually gone all the way through and I saw that off. too. So here we are, we are one fourth of the way through a two year legislative cycle. Like, what's the deal? Do you, what are the chances of some of the legislation that you're proposing to actually make it all the way to the finish line? Just that I'm going to assume they have the same chances this session as they had every other session. Um, I don't have a crystal ball and I don't have my magic eight ball with me. I was going to bring it, but I didn't. Um, but uh, I think that the chances are extremely similar to in the past. So this year, I just want to put it in context to why things may look like it's much slower than it's been in the past. This year, we have hybrid hearings. So that means that every hearing is in person and remote which has actually clogged up the pipeline a little bit because there are only certain rooms that can be used for hybrid hearings. Um, and we need to make sure that it's not just legislators that can show up and do a hearing. There's also IT people that have to show up and do a hearing. Um, and that has made the schedule a little tough, I have to tell you. I think it's great and I wouldn't go back because for Western Massachusetts people, hybrid meetings, as far as I'm concerned, are a must. It means you don't have to travel to Boston to testify. You don't have to take a day off from work. You don't have to pay for gas. You don't have to pay for parking. You can go online. I mean, you know, people who live in Boston can just jump into the state house and wait 20 minutes to testify and leave because you can only get three minutes to testify. People in Western Massachusetts have to take all day off from work yeah. for three minutes, and they don't even know when their three minutes is going to be. Um, so I'm a big believer in a hybrid, but I think that has delayed some of the hearings um, and that has probably delayed consideration. So keep these things in mind. According to the rules, every bill that gets filed gets a public hearing. Over 6,000 bills were filed. Okay, so that's one piece. The legislative journey is such that the bill goes through a hearing, a public hearing. There's deliberation, which could include research on the part of the committee. The committee votes. They either vote to advance it or they vote to put it to sleep, to put it to study. If they advance it, because let's be hopeful, it goes to usually House Ways and Means. If it has a money element, it might go to a different committee before it goes to Ways and Means. Ultimately, it goes to Ways and Means. And Ways and Means, that's where everything sits. They have to figure out what's going to be prioritized. And that's a leadership decision, which often can be influenced by outside pressure. But that's also an internal, external decision. And what gets released ends up being what we end up voting on. That's the Northern 10 bills get votes on. But at the same time, in the early part of the session, we're doing a budget. And this year, the budget was a little delayed because we have a new governor. So when you have a new governor, she's a little late getting her budget to us. That slows us down as well. Um, we still kept our regular schedule. The House finished its budget at the end of April. The Senate finished its budget last week, I believe, the, the end of May. But now they're not the same. There are things in our budget that aren't in the Senate. There are things in the Senate that aren't in the House. We got to meet and figure it all out. It's got to be identical before it goes to the governor. This is our one bill that we have to do is the budget. Um, so it'll go into a conference committee. We'll probably not see that again until July, I have a feeling. In the meantime, we may start seeing more bills come out to the floor. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a bit a little of a slow session. But I'm going to think it has to do with some of these contributing forces that weren't in existence, at least for me, in the past four years. A new governor, hybrid hearings, sort of delaying things, and making sure everything gets a hearing. Well, thanks for that clear answer. Sure, I hope that wasn't too yeah. long. Another question. Sure. Uh, you referenced the big climate bill and use the acronym TUE. Yes, TUE stands for yes. the Joint Committee on Telecommunications utilities okay. and energy okay. and it is the bill it is the committee <coughs> that deals with all the energy bills that's climate utilities in terms of the grid telecommunications and also for some reason the bottle bill comes out of that <coughs> if you ever want to check it a website to write down is www malegislature.gov. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that is the state legislature website. All the committees can be found there. All the legislators can be found there. All the bills can be found there. 
on each page for a bill. You can find out, you can download the bill and read it. You can see who the filer is. You can see who the co-sponsors are. And you can see what schedule the bill has had. Has it had a hearing? Is what committee it's in? All of that. Okay, no, no, don't worry. Well, and, and so, <laughs> so your bill is, well, one of them is um, 3596? I don't know what number I have. I think so. I just wanted to get water for you so you can speaking. 3596? I think so. HD 3596. Oh, we don't do that. So it's interesting that um, when they first get filed, they're, I consider them baby bills. They are HDs. Then when they get assigned to a committee, they're just H's and the number changes. Okay. HD stands for a house doc. That's so kind. Thank you. Yeah. So you said mine is HD. I hope I have it right. It's also accompanied by bill house number 470. Oh, 470 is the climate science. Okay. Terms. All right. Thank you. Yeah. That's just H470. Well, it's interesting because eighth grade now, um, for social studies, the, our students have to take civics, and it's likely now that they'll have to tip pass the civics MCAS as well. But I've just been hearing a lot of civics news, even as the science teacher, I hear about some of the civics stuff that the kids are doing. I'm getting a lot of emails from kids taking civic action plans throughout the district. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Get them involved. Yeah. It's good, but it's a lot of emails. <laughs> So any other questions that anybody have? This is just, I have a, this is slightly different, but it is in reference to climate change, something that I stumbled upon to uh, Kuwait tire fire. The, the country of Kuwait, they have, I guess, a large 5 million un or used tires dump and they're on fire. Oh. And if you want to, See something interesting, you can Google that. Yikes. And, and it's it's disgusting. <laughs> I was gonna like, say that doesn't sound very weight <laughs> tire fire. Okay. You gave and me something to look at least. And it's pretty pretty bad. Can't imagine being downwind from that. Um I guess it's going towards the ocean or going towards the water, so it's less of an effect. Fifteen million tires. Wow. And I guess, but we're all connected, you know, it's like you're right. from Kuwait. Unless they're, unless they're getting paid for taking used tires. That's one of the things the United States would import goods from China and then pay China to take our trash. And then China dumps it in the ocean and it comes around. So, you know, some of this environmental stuff. Right, you got to pay attention to what you're doing. For sure. Like start to finish. Well, we, we, this country wastes too much. And Nobody would do that. <laughs> Let me show you. This is the Mass Legislature website. This is what it looks like. So you know, sorry. Yes. So you know that if you were looking for a TUA, you'd go after committees. Yes. And join committees. And then it all lines up, and then you go down, and then you can see who's on the committee, what the committee is doing, all of that good stuff. Thank you. It also has everybody's email, so you can write to whatever you want. <laughs> If you write to like if you write to legislators and tell them your thoughts and concerns, I strongly recommend you write to your own legislators because otherwise people may not respond and include your address so that they know where you live so they can confirm that you're a constituent. So here's one more from a student who just did this amazing one on bumblebee population. You can kind of scroll up with your hand or you can just press the buttons to actually see what she figured out. And she was really listening to all sides of the argument. And I give her a lot of credit. I think someday I'll be voting for her for governor. So you know what UMass Amherst is the state apiary? Do you know about this? A little bit. They do field trips for classes. Mm -hmm. Just letting you know. It's very complicated bringing 110 kids from about 40 different cities. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like it's, your yeah. kids' field trips must yeah. be almost impossible. But um, you could go just yourself. Well, we actually, <laughs> we did a field trip um, this year to Barstow's, mm -hmm. and we saw their anaerobic digestion. Oh, I love their, their digest. I love their milking mission. Yeah. So, so that was a good place to go. Have you ever done things like 
take your video camera and do it yourself and then project it for your students? Oh, I'll take them out to the field and show them the different things. It, it's just, it's fairly easy with that. Um, but we'll get together. We, every <coughs> January, we go to the Boston Science Museum. That's and great. we get maybe, last year we had 300 people, including parents. Wow. Came by. Yeah. That's great. The first time I went to Barstow's and I saw the milking robot, and, you know, they explained that um, the robot, that um, when cows are happy, they're actually quiet, which I didn't realize. They don't, they don't move when they're it's easier content. To when they're content, they're just not the yeah. in there. Yeah. And the robot, they love the robot, because the robot diligent. loves them all the time. It's a hard when you go into the barn. Well, and they get to choose. They get to choose, and they choose, and when they choose too often, the robot doesn't milk them. Yeah. Just, like, so basically sends them on his way. And then you go into the barn. And the cows are all just like hanging out, like, like they're in a spot. They're just like, oh yeah, well, hanging out here. It's like, wow. The day we visited them, they were so upset because there was quite a wave of people coming in that the, the cows weren't going to the robotic milker. Oh, they were staying away. Yeah. That's not good, I guess. Not good. Because, <laughs> you know, so it's their time. It's their time to leave soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. This is thank you. Thanks thank for the you ideas. Are you leaving? I was going to leave. I'm about to speak about one of your bills. Uh oh. No, I'm in support <laughs> of your bill. I'm not sure that I won't leave. Like Please that. don't. <laughs> Which bill are you speaking about? Plastic it's bag ban. Oh, good. It's coming up for a hearing next um, week. Yeah. Are you going to submit testimony? Yeah, I'll be there. Oh, that's wonderful. Then I'm definitely staying. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, All right. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Uh, is your job from seventh grade? Yes, she is. Okay. Thanks for taking those cows. <laughs> there were a lot of neighbors who stepped up. It was really awful sort of seeing the fire break out and seeing the next few hours and lots of firefighters were fighting it. Um, but I'm just stunned at how people have stepped up for their neighbors. There were like 30 cows, I think, that have now gone to all different farms. Yeah, maybe even 50. They might have milk and kept them out. Maybe. Steve just said 30. He said 30 all told. And they went to the vines, Maple Line, yeah. of Goulet, yeah, and then one in South Deerfield. On our way? I believe so. Okay. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Myra, you're up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, I spoke to the committee uh, last month. Was it last month already? Must have been. Your last meeting um, about the organization I work for. I'm an attorney at the Conservation Law Foundation and their Zero Waste Project. And so I shared with the committee what my project does and talked about some legislative priorities that we have this session for dealing with um, waste in the Commonwealth. And one of our priorities um, is getting the plastic bag bill that Representative Dom is a sponsor of, or the, you introduced that bill mm. along with Senator mm. Eldridge. Yep. And um, that's one of our number one priorities. We have 156 municipalities across the Commonwealth that have already passed ordinances um, banning single-use plastic bags at checkout. So obviously there is a groundswell of support for this. Hadley is one of the um, cities and towns that has done that. And so I am, I live in Western Massachusetts, I live in Northampton, so I've reached out to all of the Western Massachusetts cities and towns that have already passed these ordinances, asking them to sign on, either um, submit testimony or sign on to a joint letter saying, look, we did it and we want leadership at the state level to pass this ban um, statewide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I... Um, I'm asking the Hadley Climate Change Committee to sign on to that um, joint letter. And that's my request for today. I have a copy of the letter here. And I've um, some of the cities and towns I've talked to have already taken action and committed to it. Lee, for example, had a select board meeting earlier this week and they voted, the select board voted to um, sign on um, in Dalton, their green committee has. So in different cities and towns, it's a different approach. Sometimes it's select board, sometimes the mayor. Um, in East Hampton, it's the city councilor who's signing on. So it's not necessarily universally the same body from each municipality. But what I really want to show is that all of these cities and towns have um, a leader, a representative from that community that 
wants to see statewide action. So would you say a little bit more, and I don't know if you've summarized it in such a way, but what's this, what's similar and what's different to Hadley's covering plastic reduction? I'm sorry. Well, Do you have a sense of how this bill is similar or different? Oh, to your ordinance? Yeah. Yeah, this bill is, um, is, is restricted to single-use plastic bags at checkout. So I think it, you cover more items. And there are mm -hmm. other bills that have been introduced um, and will be heard next Wednesday at the Environment Committee that deal with other kinds of single-use plastics like straws um, or takeout containers. And so there is an opportunity to weigh in on those. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't get over ambitious and therefore lose the battle with the plastic bags. So I I'm really focusing, appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm focusing this joint effort on only the plastic bag bill. I'm going to be submitting testimony in support of all the other different bills that are dealing with single-use plastics, including the extended producer responsibility for plastic packaging law. Oh, God, yes. So, please, I invite you to, to submit testimony. And if anyone wants templates or resources, I'm a resource to you um, and happy to support you in, in getting testimony in. But this bill deals with plastic bags only. And it, the three main components to the bill, which are really, really important, and you have the author of the bill here, so you could ask her if you'd like, but you tell me if I'm representing your Please bill well. Please go for it. I love hearing it. Um, that a, that a, a reusable bag um, is defined very clearly so that we can't replace it with other kinds of bags that are not um, that don't meet these criteria. That it has um, a stitched handle as opposed to a heat fused handle. So that means we won't be replacing thin film plastic bags with thicker film plastic bags. It also has to be washable, which is a really key component to having a reusable bag. And then it has to be of some kind of woven material, which doesn't mean that it won't contain some element of plastic because polyester is plastic based, but at least it will be washable, which means you can use it for, you know, generation after. Use after a long, use. long time. Yeah, as opposed to just a short period of time until it gets soiled and then disposing of it. Um, it also would e allow the cities and towns to impose a 10 cent fee on the paper bags that they hand out um, in lieu of uh, a reusable bag or plastic bag at checkout should a customer not have a reusable bag. And that's really important because right now, while cities have the ability to impose a fee on paper bags, towns in Massachusetts do not. And so we have a store could impose a store can, but the or the or the ordinance that, that the town passes cannot require the um, retailers to charge a fee. And the reason that's important is because we want to incentivize people to bring right, their reasonable right. bags. Right. So five cents of that um, paper bag fee would be returned under this bill to the city or town of origin to be used for other kinds of sustainability measures, which is a really great way to invest in other kinds of activities in the community that can promote sustainability. Um, so those are the main features in, in my mind, but um, Representative Dom, can you add anything about well, your Well, the one bill? thing I can add is we also added a food service piece in there because of these students in Crocker Farm who were able to convince their food service vendor to move to paper. Mm -hmm. So we included food service settings in um, educational settings as a, as a group, which I really, I feel attached to now because I've met these fifth graders who fought for this. Um, I love the way you described the bill. I think it's home run completely. Um, the one thing I would tell you about this bill is that this bill has been kicking around the legislature for a couple of sessions. Before me, it was filed by Representative Lori Ehrlich, who represented like the Marblehead area. Um, she retired from the House because she became head of FEMA under President Biden. Um, and so the bill was in the Environment Committee last year without a lead filer. And I happened to be the acting chair of that committee at that time because I was the vice chair. She left the House. Um, another rep left the House, and this bill became ours. And so I was very involved in making sure that all the stakeholders had, had their voices heard, that we heard the pros and the cons. And I have to say, this bill, I think people around the table, which is unusual in environment bills, all could come to agreement on it. Environmentalists could come to agreement on it. The vendors could come to agreement on it. Um, the paper manufacturers, to some extent, came to agreement on it. So it's you know there's all these different interests, and I think people you know felt like this was a fair bill to move forward. For me, it's really about. <coughs> I, I so appreciate the fact that you said you didn't want it to get lost because I think what's happened is, is that our attention now has 
got has expanded in a lot of ways to include a lot of other plastic yeah. sort of uses. And because municipalities are doing them independently, it has sort of moved us to the side. And the the role for the state to be leaders in this has not necessarily diminished the reality, but maybe in perception. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually gained in perception because 156 towns, that's like, you know, half, half the Commonwealth. That's more than half the Commonwealth. Um, and it shouldn't be, you shouldn't, it shouldn't be based on zip code whether or not we say plastic is a good thing or not, right? We should be saying we, we support reusable bags wherever you are. So what's what's the argument? Like, why are you anti-single-use bag in a sentence or two? I'm just curious. Sure. What's sure. the case? I'll, let, I'll, I'll, I'll fill in the blanks after the conservation. Okay. So um, pl plastics of all sorts pollute our environment. Um, but plastic bags and beverage containers are one of the most commonly littered items. And so when these plastic items end up in our environment, they clog our waterways, they break down to microplastics, they end up contaminating our water, our soil. Um, if they end up in incinerators, mm -hmm. um, which is often the, the end uh, place of plastic waste, they end up contaminating our air. And at this point in time, we have discovered microplastics and the chemicals that are contained in plastics in our bodies, in our blood. Um, we need to really turn off the tap of single-use plastic if we want to create um, a sustainable and healthy, vibrant environment for all living things. Um, and so this is one way, frankly, the easiest way that we can start to eliminate single-use plastics from our lives because everybody has already become accustomed to using their reusable shopping bags. And it's so commonplace now that Stop and Shop, which is not just, you know, a small retailer or even a, a Massachusetts-based retailer, much, much broader, um, uh, many, many stores across New England has pledged to eliminate plastic bags from all of their locations starting in July of 2023. Mm -hmm. So how can we as a state, Massachusetts, be behind the curve on Stop and Shop? And then not to mention, there are four other New England states that have already passed statewide plastic bag bans. Rhode Island, Connecticut, Maine, Maine and Vermont. Yeah. So only New Hampshire and Massachusetts and Rhode Island and uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire out of the New England states hasn't passed a statewide ban yet. Mm. So this year has to be the year that we do it. And then we can start tackling, I mean, I'm not going to stop tackling other single-use plastics for sure, but we can't wait for um, complete consensus that we're going to end the use of all single-use plastics. We have to we have to move at a measured pace. We have to um, take what we can get. And right now, we can definitely get plastic use uh, single-use plastic bags out of our lives because we're already accustomed to carrying our shopping bags in our cars and in our bikes and we know how to do it yeah. 156 that, towns and cities across the state are already doing it that was a pretty savvy answer yeah thanks i that's, think it's right the one item at a time so you have consensus look at the problem we had with all the things we put in ours plastic but we still got it passed it's, we did but you know, I, the straws were an issue, um, and some of the food containers. Were oh, an styrofoam. Issue. Well, I dealt with the legislation on uh, food containers when I was the acting chair last session, and one piece that I wanted to make sure happened in there was that we projected out to date because I felt like restaurants and takeout places were getting clobbered through COVID, and it was unfair actually to make yeah. that bill take immediate effect. Um, this bill, on the other hand, I have no problem saying it should take immediate effect. I add one more thing that plastic bags do that we don't want them to do, and they kill fish. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when we took when we think about not just fish that we like to see, but fish that we like to eat, um, potentially, you know, they can destroy you know aquatic habitats and livelihoods. Um, but you did that's great. They also, you didn't even touch on the fact that they're made from fossil fuels. Yes, yes. They And they also clog our recycling system. Yep. So they make the job of the, the workers at our material uh, recovery facilities much, much right. harder and much more dangerous. And the, the this fee piece in there is really important because part of what was uh, what my understanding was for a long time, you might know better than me in terms of the history of the bill, 
the fee was sort of a, a point of contention. Should there be a fee? What would the fee be? Who would get the money from the fee? Where would the fee be able to be used? All those kinds of questions. And by saying DOR will bring it back and it'll go back to municipalities, that's a good thing. Municipalities need the money and they can use it for, you know, other kinds of recycling and, um, you know, kind of pro and environmental programs, which is important because on this other plate or burner that we have over here, Municipalities are facing increasing recycling costs that are just skyrocketing. Plus, we also have a mattress ban um, in Massachusetts, which also places financial burdens on towns. Hadley and Amherst know that better yeah. than most um, twice a year. So, you know, getting some funds back just in case, you know, hopefully none because, you know, hopefully people bring their own bags. But when they buy paper bags, this will be a revenue stream that can help municipalities so does that mean that stores would have to charge people the fee no, no. so what happened in hadley was and i heard her say it i wondered okay. we had a 10 cent thing in our building the so the town meeting passed and we sent it to the lawyers and they took it out because we're a town not a city and we're not allowed yeah so. but what i've noticed the stores around here doing is rather than charging you for a bag or a paper bag or something you get a five cent credit if you bring your own bag. So they're incentivizing bringing your own bag. Well, and it's interesting too, because Walmart, Walmart charges 10 cents for a paper bag. They do. But I, Walmart will also me. say you can bring None your own bag. None of that's coming back to Hadley. Yeah, so <laughs> they're doing the work, not not Hadley. So. But Walmart, you can also bring your own bags. Too. Yes, you can. Yes. Okay. But, but I, one thing, and, and I'm not, a, you know, I'm not going to argue about plastic bags, but the system today, the Amazon delivery system is pretty slick, but it's very wasteful where you have, you know, all this packaging and then a van goes out and they, they do route everything. But, you know, you talk about waste going into the, you know, the stream, waste stream or whatever you call it, as the... And, and don't worry, I bought from Amazon, so I'm not going to say I'm, I'm, I'm innocent, but the it's a very inefficient, wasteful system. And it's just a, you know, I, I yeah, I, I, I wish we had a, a cleaner earth. I think you would really like the extended producer responsibility yes, for packaging so bill, which I am a big fan of. Um, and is also going to be heard by the Environment Committee next week. I, I'm not asking, I'm not soliciting your um, testimony for this joint letter on that, but you're, but I can certainly provide copies of the bill or fact sheets on it if you're interested in submitting testimony on your own. And it is um, a bill that would require the producers of plastic packaging to reduce the amount of packaging they use, increase the recyclability of the packaging, decrease the toxicity of their packaging and move towards a reuse packaging economy. How about taking it back? Germany did that and it worked. Right. Isn't there another bill that's like that that makes the users like a, a better bottle bill is the one I'm thinking of, where it's a higher deposit on that's another bill that, that will but be but it also makes like Coke and everybody responsible for getting their bottles back. Well, so that would be the there is a um, modernization of the bottle bill that will be heard um, later this month on June twenty eighth in front of the TUE committee that the representative was speaking about while we are, and that bill would increase the bottle um, deposit to ten cents, and it would include all beverage containers as small as nips and up to three liters, regardless of including wine bottles, everything. Yes, regardless yeah. of their contents, but especially nips. Nip. Oh my God! <laughs> what a disaster! Well, but the extended producer responsibility bill, the book, the piece that's really interesting about that is that it the producers come together, and the whole thing is designed so that it's an incentive for them to start. Do not make so many to, different kinds of plastics. They're setting the goals. That. They set the standards. I think this is what the EPR bill does, right? And it they then and what it in other places where they've done extended producer responsibility, it's had the effect that all of us want. They're not necessarily thrilled with it initially, but because they're almost in kind of control of what they're how they're going about doing it, 
it gives them a measure of control for doing it. I believe that's what EPR is. There's different yeah. kinds of EPR bills that have been passed around the country. New York State has one right now that tomorrow is going to be voted on. And if it's passed, it's going to be the mo most robust EPR bill in the entire country. Mm -hmm. And Massachusetts bill is practically identical to that. So I'm really excited to see if that passes mm -hmm. in New York State. One, one, one thing with the bottle bill, the, the 10 cent deposit, I, I personally feel is reasonable. However, you know, minimum wage is fifteen dollars an hour. You, it costs the grocer or the retailer or whoever money to handle this product coming back. So if, if even if two cents went to the retailer for doing the work for the state, it'd be nice because you know the consumer is paying for it, and it's it's you know the state grabs it if. If I buy a soda, which I rarely do, and I throw the can away, and the state keeps the 10 cents, well, it'd be nice if the retailer gets some kind of kick. Yeah, that's a really good point. There's actually two streams of revenue in the bottle bill, but we only hear about the deposit because that's the only one that's public facing. So when I buy a beverage, I pay that five cent deposit right now. It would be 10, 10 cent if, it, right. if we modernize it. And then I get that five cents or 10 cents back when I return the bottle. Mm -hmm for recycling, but there's actually a different stream of revenue called the handling fee that the, the, the distributors of the beverages pay the retailer or the redemption center per bottle or can for the processing of exactly what you're describing, because otherwise it would be unpaid labor yes. by the by the um, retailer or um, redemption center. And the, the um, handling fees have not increased. And so, this um this modernization of the bottle bill would increase the handling fees and actually what it would also do is it have a trigger within the, the bill so that at any point in time there aren't enough retailers and redemption centers across the state of Massachusetts to make redemption easy and, and possible for everybody, that it would increase the handling fee to incentivize people to go into the business of taking of creating redemption centers because that is a business model that people do do create. I mean, it, people's entire livelihoods can be based on redemption of bottles and cans, but they have to earn enough per bottle and can to make that feasible. So the bill would automatically increase that handling fee if at any point in time the number of redemption centers um, is insufficient to support the the bottle bill. And so this this bill is really clever because it doesn't require legislators take any action in the future should um, the recycling rates or should the redemption centers um, dip below certain levels, it just automatically triggers and increases uh, the handling fee. But the interesting thing about it is it's the exact same handling fee regardless of what kind of beverage container it is. So some retailers have expressed some real concern about the bottle bill because they think um, that it's going to put additional burden on them in terms of processing the beverage containers. But the thing is that it, just imagine if you sold, I don't know how many nips one might sell in a month, but if you sold, let's just say a thousand nips and you took all those nips back, you have um, a two cent uh, handling fee on each of those. Those nips don't take up much, much space. You actually would make as a retailer as much on the handling fees as you probably did selling them those beverages in the first place because the 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 um, the price that the retailers sell their nips for is only a, a few cents over what they paid for it. So it actually could be, um, it that? could be a money maker to the retailers, which is really important because the bottle bill opponent. There's two different camps of bottle bill opponents. One is big beverage, the distributors, because they don't want to pay the handling fees, um, and they don't want to be told what to do <laughs> by the state. But the and the other is the the retailers who don't want to lose revenue, and I'm very sympathetic to them because I want to. I don't want um, our efforts to create a more sustainable economy to negatively impact our local businesses. Um, so that's why this this bottle bill is actually really strong because it it pays them enough to to do the work of uh, taking back our bottles and cans. I think that's a really legitimate concern, and um, I definitely share your your feelings about that. Myra, looking toward next week mm -hmm. and what you need, there are a few ways that we can support it. Uh, one is adding our name to the letter you had mentioned about that. Another is through public testimony. How how can we help with either of those? Well, if you give me authorization today, I will add whoever 
the representative, probably you, Jack, to the joint letter. Um, or I could give you a copy of it and you could print it on your letterhead and sign your name to it. And then I will, uh, I will attach it to the packet that I submit to the committee next week um, when I give my testimony representing, you know, that I have communicated with these cities and towns in Western Massachusetts and we support this statewide ban. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. And that's probably the simplest thing. You could just, if you just authorize me to do that, I will do that. Separately, I can email you um, the page that gives the instructions for signing up to testify and you can sign up virtually or um, it, it's tricky because that's my second to the last day of school. Yeah. So like when, you know. So anyone here or anyone on the committee who wants to testify, I can I send don't have you the time to testify. Yeah. I just wrote a letter, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, in that, I've written a separate letter. I signed on the surf rider thing that was oh, going right. around. Right. Um, I did it as an individual too, but yeah. I think it's, it would carry some weight well, to be representing the town. Well, right? would, would you have an opportunity? No. Terrible. No. Uh -huh. I'm all for signing something, but well, we can submit written testimony, right? Yeah. If you get, if you authorize me to, I will just add your name to the um, the the representatives of the cities and towns that I've spoken so to. How do the other members feel about authorizing? Fine with me. Yeah. So, I'll, do I use your name, your title, yeah. and your email? If you yeah. can spell it. I thought you were being hijacked, so I'm sure I can't figure it out. That was a little funny. <laughs> Psychowski is how you say it. Yeah, yes. okay. Thank you. It's tricky. It's, it's, it's not that bad individual. once you're used to so it. So we say it. Myron Psychowski. I always say it. Chuck, but it sucks. Well, if we were in Poland, it'd be Tchaikovsky, like the composer. I, I went on it today, and oh. I just wrote a letter. I can submit it. Okay. We were just chatting you. about how you can individually yeah. submit written testimony if you want to, in addition to the... Yeah. And Susie, thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, I, thank you so much. It's yeah. so worth me staying. I'm glad you did. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We got to move um, on. We have to, and I know I think you have to go very soon. I, I will thank say you. that I'm willing to volunteer for the gardeners' events where they're collecting plastic containers. So I can actually make that sure. At Gardner's Supply in Hadley. Is that on a Saturday? Yes. That's on a Saturday. That's on a Saturday. I might be able to do it. That would be great. If you I have some it. pots to bring. Thank, yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So I That's guess if I'm going to find Thank you so much for Thank coming. Thank you for working overtime. Oh, I'm I really appreciate it. Thank you. Work is only about We're the similar pitch for the body. It's a studio. Is it next month? It's at the end of this month. Yeah. I would like to well. So that. the next meeting would be July thirteenth. Oh, okay. Well, do you? If I haven't drafted a joint letter on yeah. on, on in support of the bottle bill modernization yet, but if I do that and I approach all the same cities and towns, you want to participate in that as well? I would like this. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just. Yeah. Let, I will hopefully yeah. I'll do that. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna see Thank you so much. The first half of July, but then. Okay. You know. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, and everybody. Just touch me thank you. I'm right across the bridge, and I'm doing this work all throughout the state, so I want to keep collaborating with you. That's great. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you for the okay. work you do. Yeah. Thank what you. A, what a great spokesperson. Bye. Um, Good night. So, Jane and everybody else, Tom, if you didn't hear, I'm volunteering, and maybe, Kathy, we can make it to the Gardener Supply. It's really interesting because there was a member of the town who does not want their name mentioned who said... She really appreciated the Firestone Collected Tires Day. And she also thought it was interesting timing that I think it was East Hampton Savings Bank also had a paper shredding event right in the same Home Depot parking lot. And she could do, they could do two for one. So you don't know how some of these events will sell. Um, this was actually initiated by Gardner Supply. It's a good event. So yeah. I'll let Nathan know. They right. used to just have a bin you could throw them in. Well, that was, yeah, oh. the old days. <laughs> it was a little easier. Uh, when it comes to green communities, we have not heard back from the DOER, from Mass DOER, but they are feeling very optimistic. They have no more questions for Hadley on our application. So hopefully by next month we'll be able to say, yes, we got the $130,000 grant. Do you have any comments about composting and the composting grant or not? 
I'm not sure what you mean by composting grant. The one um, that Catalina is working on? No, because she did not share any of that information okay. with me. Right. Oh, what I can say is what we have in the for the uh, recycling dividend program grant. And and I we're, we just put in with Northampton and Hadley, we're, we're going in on another joint compost bin purchase. So they just now sent the order off. So I guess it'll be a couple of weeks. We'll get 10 more compost bins. But as as we after those 10 are paid for, we now have two thousand eight hundred two thousand eighty nine dollars in that grant fund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I anticipate at least one more purchase during this grant year from that amount of 10 more. So far, we've sold 22 compost. Are these the large bins or the small bins or the, combination? No, the earth machine. Okay. Yeah. So, and I, you know, told Christina, it, it was before this latest um, distribution, but that we could probably swing three or $400 towards this compost gotcha. promotion. You right. should take a sign about those bins to the plastic container Our collection. Do you want it? Take a sign that the town is selling the composting bins when you're at the plastic container recycling. I wonder if I could even pick up a few bins for us to have them there. I'll, I'll see if what they can say. No, no, no. no. Well, if we're going to do the uh, gardener's supply, clean up your plastic pots day, yeah. we could also promote. Oh, because that's one thing to get Unless the Unless they're selling points. them. Maybe. No, I don't think they do. I mean, we can check. I, okay. I actually think I've seen them there. So Earth they, machines? They, yeah. I don't know if Earth machines, but they, I think they sell well, we can, composting. We can do this. It, it, he's actually the um, manager is being quite communicative. He really wants to spread the word with our help. About composting? Yeah. Oh, so that's cool. good. Because that would complete... Uh, to get you know to get this grant money, certain all these different designations, you have to do these certain mm -hmm. things, and then you get the points. So for composting, we have fulfilled everything except for like a demo or something out in the world to promote it. Yes. you know we do have videos on our website, so I I you know, put that and hopefully we're going to get the five points, but it would be good if we did something. I mean, I know it's more work, but the ideal place to do something like that is like you're running for office at the dump on Saturday morning. What, have bins over there? Just have signs that you have them available. Call me at this number. Interesting. Okay. Hey, a reminder for everybody on the committee, um, forms go into Jennifer James at the town hall. You can email the forms as well as dropping them off just to renew your yes, please. membership. Please send them. Um, I sent one. And then repeating um, what I said earlier, the seventh graders should have the signs that keep Hadley clean, don't trash our town. They should have some of those made soon. And what well, I'll do is I actually cover them with urethane. And it held so up very fun. well. Yeah. What? They're really holding up. They very have held up really well, and that's been a good thing. It's like every other year, our her students are doing it. So if you get me a list of where you want them, I'll get them to Scott, and he'll put them up. Excellent. I have to tell you, I was so disappointed. There is one sign on Farm Lane, or whatever, the Spruce Lane. Yes. Um, and... I walked there the other day, and there was all this trash, like t 10 yards in front of it. And that's why they have to have it put there. No. Well, I mean, we but been... it was right at the foot of it, essentially. So, yeah. you know, people are Ooh, just... We actually oh. moved one sign to, to go yeah. there to yeah, yeah. help spread the word. No, I noticed it. It was finally there. But it was like, literally, the garden was yeah, right in front of it. Say, I walk here, and it's a mess. We need your sign. Right. So. Yeah. Oh. Anyway. That's really disappointing. I know. I, like I just wanted to like, signing us. <laughs> that that whole road is like it's like just trash it left and right. It's unbelievable. Wow. Yeah, I I like every two weeks I walk home with like stuff in my in my pockets, just pick it up. 
Well, in the cans around Mount Warner, it just doesn't stop. Yeah. Even since they locked the gate? No, no, no. I'm saying on the actual Mount oh, Warner no. Road around the curve by Architectural Millworks, it's just a fairly steady stream. And Rocky Hill. What is the matter with people? I don't know. Well, it's interesting, too. I think, I think the town <laughs> needs an ordinance. There needs to be a fine for littering. If, if people saw signs around town that said, no littering, $500 fine, I guarantee you they'd stop throwing it up. Do you know how so involved much. it is to pass an ordinance and have a fine on it and then have to get the legalese done about who can impose the fine and where no, the I money don't. goes? No, I don't. But all I know is that... I'll bring it up. That, I that would... Up. I, I, there's no incentive to not do it right now. It's just your own good conscience. But if people are afraid they're going to get pulled over Murders and get a five hundred dollar ticket, sorry, thanks from the police yeah. throwing a beer can out yeah. out the window, I think they'll think twice. No, I'll, 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 I'll see if I can get it on the agenda. I can get it on the agenda. We'll see what happens. With okay. It. Yeah. All right. Thank All right. you for I'm going to have to right. take it on too. Yeah. All right. So we call this meeting to. Close, we have.